The Eland Armored Car takes its Afrikaans name from the African Eland, the largest antelope in the world. Like its namesake, the Eland evolved to adapt to the tough southern African environment. Its design, adaption, and production happened just before South Africa became the subject of international embargoes in the 1970s, spurred on by its racial segregation policies against the backdrop of the Cold War in Southern Africa, which saw a steep rise in liberation movements backed by the socialist sphere of countries such as Cuba and Eastern Europe. Welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host, Wood, and today I'll be guiding you through the history and design of the Eland Armored Car. Thank you to those who have already subscribed. To those who haven't, hit the subscribe button below. I wouldn't want you missing out on any of our new videos. If you'd like to contribute more directly, you can join the ranks of our channel's members or make a donation on Patreon or PayPal. It helps us keep you informed on the latest and greatest developments in the armored sphere. Up until the late 1950s, the Union Defense Force, which would later become the South African Defense Force, or SADF, made use of the Ferret Armored Car. A subsequent macro-environmental study in the early 1960s showed that the most likely conflict South Africa would become involved in would take the form of expeditionary missions and counterinsurgencies for which the Ferret was not well suited. This shortcoming necessitated the acquisition of more modern, lightweight, lightly armored, well-armed, long-range reconnaissance vehicles. Initially, three armored cars were considered, namely the Saladin, Panhard EBR, and Panhard AML. Ultimately, the four-wheeled AML was deemed the most appropriate to fulfill the desired role South Africa had in mind. The initial testing of the AML-60 with its 60mm cannon was deemed lacking in firepower, and South Africa requested more. This led Panhard to design a new turret which would accommodate a DEFA 90mm low-pressure quick-firing gun. South Africa purchased 100 AMLs as well as the additional turrets, engines, and parts for the assembly of 800 more armored cars. The manufacturing of the AML 60 and 90, which were rebranded the Eland 60 and 90 respectively, would become one of South Africa's most ambitious weapons manufacturing programs post-World War II. Production by the South African industrial firm Sandrock Austral of the AML 60 and 90 subsequently began in 1961, with the first batch entering service trials in 1962 as the Eland Mark I. In essence, they were still French AML 60s and 90s. These armored cars contained 40% local content, with the majority of parts being purchased from Panhard. The Eland 1690 became the standard armored car for the SADF's armored car regiments and served a reconnaissance role when assigned to tank regiments. The Eland was removed from frontline service in the late 1980s when its indigenously produced replacement, the Rui Kat 76 armored car, began to enter service. The Eland was officially retired from South African National Defense Force service in 1994. In South Africa, the Eland can be found at most military bases today as gate guards and several pairs in working condition are preserved at military museums, which includes the SA Armor Museum in Bloemfontein. Several Elands have also found their way into the hands of private collectors and foreign museums. By the end of its production, more than 1,600 vehicles were built. The Eland family of armored cars, which also includes a 20mm model, are still in service with foreign armies, which include Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad, Gabon, Ivory Coast, Malawi, Morocco, Safrawi Arab Democratic Republic, Senegal, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. The Eland saw continued design improvements over the original AML throughout its production, making it more adept to the African battle space. In line with its role as a lightweight, heavily armed reconnaissance vehicle, the Eland could pack a decisive punch when needed, making it a versatile weapons platform for its time. The following sections will specifically cover the Mark 7 variant, unless otherwise. The Southern African battle space favors a wheeled configuration, and the Eland's permanent 4x4 was well suited. The Eland's suspension consisted of fully independent trailing arms, single spiral coil springs, and double action hydraulic shock absorbers on each wheel station. It's not amphibious, but it can ford 82 centimeters of water with preparation. It is powered by a General Motors 4-cylinder, 2.5-liter petrol engine, which can produce 87 horsepower at 4,600 RPM. This gives a 16.4 horsepower per ton power-to-weight ratio for the Elan 60 and 14.5 horsepower per ton for the Elan 90. The maximum road speed is 90 km per hour, or 56 miles per hour. Over terrain, you're looking at 30 km per hour, or 19 miles an hour. 
Both vehicles carry a standard complement of three crew members, a commander, gunner, and driver. The Elin 90 is armed with a GT2 manufactured by Danel Land Systems. For combat, it would fire a low-velocity high-explosive, high-explosive anti-tank tracer round, white phosphorus smoke, and canister rounds. The high explosive was accurate up to 2200 meters and the heat T 1200 meters and could penetrate up to 320 millimeters of rolled homogenous at 90 degrees. The penetration and after armor effect of the heat T round was devastating against the T 3485 the South Africans faced in the early stages of the South African border war. When the T 5455 entered the conflict, South African Elan 90 crews had to make full use of their vehicle's small size and speed to flank them. Multiple shots by the Elan 90 were necessary to disable and destroy those new tanks. A well-trained crew could fire this main gun either when static or at a short halt every 8 to 10 seconds. The turret could be rotated a full 360 degrees in under 25 seconds, although the standard practice was not to exceed 90 degrees left or right of center. The main gun can elevate from negative 8 degrees up to 15. Due to its small size, the Elan 90 carries 29 main gun rounds. A total of 16 is stored in the rear of the turret, 5 behind the vehicle commander and gunner's seat respectively, and another 3 at the bottom right of the turret basket. The Elan 60 retained the original AML-60 turret and made use of the South African manufactured 60mm M2 breech loading gun mortar. They could fire a 1.72 kilogram bomb at 200 meters per second at up to 2,000 meters in the direct roll. A total of 56 bombs are carried which consisted of a combination of bombs and illumination rounds. The main armament can elevate from negative 11 to 75 degrees. The rate of fire was on average 6 to 8 bombs a minute. It was primarily used in the counterinsurgency and convoy protection role as its main gun was devastatingly effective against infantry and dug in positions like bunkers and trenches. It primarily served in southwest African north operational areas. The gunner makes use of an Eloptro 6x gunner's day sight. Laying the Elan 90's gun is accomplished via a hand crank, while sighting by the gunner is done via telescopic sight, which was linked to the main gun. The Elan 90's main gun was not stabilized due to the lack of a turret drive. This required exceptionally skilled Elan 90 crews, who had to work in concert to engage enemy targets as quickly as possible while minimizing their exposure and then getting out before they could be shot at. For protection, the Elan consisted of welded steel plate hull, which is between 8 and 12 millimeters thick, providing all-around protection against rifle fire, grenades, and medium artillery velocity fragments. It is, however, susceptible to anything bigger than 50 cal. Two banks of two electrically operated 81 millimeter smoke grenade launchers are located on the rear left and right side of the turret and are used for self-screening in an emergency. There are two tubes to the rear of the left smoke grenade launchers that are often confused for being them. These tubes are, however, used to house the main gun cleaning brush. Due to its small size, it was never equipped with a fire suppression system. Crews had at their disposal a couple of handheld fire extinguishers, one on the front right exterior of the vehicle, above the right wheel, and one inside the crew compartment. The Elan served with distinction in the SADF for nearly three decades the majority of the time spent during the South African border war. As predicted, the conflict took the form of cross-border insurgency and the Eland was subsequently deployed to the northern part of the SWA in 1969 to counter the threat. People's Liberation Army of Namibia insurgents then began a campaign of mine warfare to disrupt the South African transportation and logistics networks, which lasted for two decades. Elands were tasked with escorting convoys and it soon became apparent that they were vulnerable to these landmines. This resulted in South Africa's drive to develop mine-resistant vehicles like the Buffel Mine Protected Vehicle and Casper Armored Personnel Carriers, which would take over the patrol and counterinsurgency role. This need for mine-resistant vehicles inadvertently led South Africa to become a world leader in the field out of necessity. The Elan 90 played a valuable role as a reconnaissance, anti-armor, and fire support platform during the conventional phase of the border war. It was involved in various SADF operations, which include Savannah, Reindeer, Skeptic, Protea, and Ascari. It was during Operation Ascari that the limitations of the Elan 90s were reached. The introduction by People's Armored Forces of Liberation of Angola of T-5455 MBTs stretched the Elan 90 crews to their limit, 
as the MBTs required multiple hits from several armored cars to set them ablaze. The limited number of main gun rounds carried made such engagements problematic and hastened the fatigue of the main gun's recoil system. Additionally, the Elin 90s could not match the cross-country performance of the Rattel 90. post discari review panels noted the advancing age of the Elin 90 as one of the shortcomings of the operation. The subsequent anti-armor role was passed on to the Rattel 90, which made use of the same turrets, but whose height advantage gave it better situational awareness in addition to its better overall performance. The Elin 90 was subsequently withdrawn from frontline service in Angola and gradually placed in the role of which it was intended, counterinsurgency. The Elins were once again relegated to escorting convoys, conducting joint patrols, guarding strategic installations, man roadblocks, and conducting search and destroy operations in SWA. The Elin 90 was also used as training vehicles for the Rattel 90 crews. The last major use of the Elin took place at the height of the border war during Operation Modular. On October 5th, Elin 90 supported by infantry equipped with anti-tank weaponry set up an ambush north of Angiva. The ambush was a success, and the SADF forces ambushed and destroyed a FAPLA motorized contingent consisting of BTR-60, BTR-40 APCs, and truck-mounted infantry as they advanced to Angiva. With the conclusion of the border war in 1989 and subsequent peace, defense spending was drastically cut. Having been succeeded by the Royakot 76, the Elin's end was on the horizon. The SADF, for a brief period, considered keeping at least one squadron of Elans alive should the need arise for air portable armored capability. This was, however, quickly set aside as the need for deploying forces outside the border was pretty remote and the continued pressure to reduce the number of older equipment quashed that notion. Afterwards, the new SANDF retired the Elan from service in 1994. This decision would be proven wrong as the Sandef would deploy across Africa as part of UN peacekeeping missions. The Eland is still in service with various African countries. And with that, we come to the end of another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. Thank you for watching, and if for whatever reason you feel like South Africa should reintroduce the Eland into service, leave a comment below. Consider subscribing if you haven't already, and until next time, keep us in your sights.